yeah, you mentioned that that you consider them as languages, the dialects. And it's funny because in my case, people don't understand me always because of my dialect, even other Swiss people, right? <laughs> so, so a language, basically, the difference between a language and a dialect is mutual intelligibility. So if, for instance, I speak Hochdeutsch, and I can't understand people when they speak Bavarian or people when they speak Swiss, and neither can most other Germans. So on that basis, these are separate languages. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think calling them a dialect really sort of denigrates them and reduces their prestige. And sometimes in the past, it's made people even ashamed of speaking them, which is a shame because the younger generation have lost so much of their culture and, and heritage. I agree. And also the Internet is kind of making the dialects disappear, I think. Because well, yeah, it, everything is standardized. Yeah, it's a shame. Back in the day, in my canton, you know, it is really surrounded by mountains, and not that long ago, it was difficult to to travel to the other parts of Switzerland. But nowadays, there is the tunnel, and that means that you can travel fast. And of course, because of the internet, it also changed now. But back in the day, I mean let's say 20 years ago, it was quite different. And yeah, in a way it's, it's a, a shame because I think that some dialects are disappearing. I mean, the original of the dialects, because I, I think oftentimes people adapt to, to other languages and then they don't use their dialect anymore. <laughs> But it's so, even where I'm living in Bavaria, if you just cross the river, is the river Lech is the boundary between Bavarian and Schwäbisch. Schwäbisch is similar to some of the, the languages they speak in Switzerland. And it's wonderful just to see how culture changes, history changes. Language is a wonderful thing. Yes, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a living creature, I, I like to say. <laughs> You're absolutely right, yeah. So... Congratulations on your book, John. I really liked it and it was fantastic. Even though I assume that I am not the target um, audience or the, the target reader, because in my case, I already learned several languages. But, but yeah, we can talk about it later. <laughs> Well, thank you, first of all, for your congratulations. It's, it's been a, a labor of love. I'm not sure whether you're the target audience or not. We can speak about that later. But uh, thank you very much for having me on your podcast. I thought that we could make it in three sections. First, I would like to talk a little bit about you and then about your journey or your safari to Africa. <laughs> and then... I'd like to talk about your book. Last but not least, I would love to hear about your favorite expression. This can be in English or from any other languages that you want to talk. Sounds good. Of course, if you don't want to answer a question or something like that, just say so and then I will edit the part out and it's no worries at all. <laughs> no, you can, you can throw whatever you have at me. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer everything. <laughs> okay, nice. Can you please introduce yourself a little bit? Okay, my name's John Stedman. I'm now 60 years old, I hate to say. Just that was my last birthday. Until I was 30, I only spoke my mother tongue, which is English. I, I grew up in a very monocultural, monolingual little town in England. And I never met anyone who spoke another language. I, after many, many years of traveling and working in different countries, I now speak 10. Wow. <laughs> you are a translator, right? I work as a lot of things. Uh, I'm an author now. I'd, I hope that's going to be my number one profession from now on. I work as a translator too. Also as an interpreter, I interpret from Lingala and French into German 
for the, uh, the Federal Refugee Agency here. And I'm also a, a language trainer. I give online language training. And you have also a website. What is the name of the website? The website is www.thelanguagesecret. That's all one word, thelanguagesecret.com. Okay, and also there are some very useful blog posts because you also write about different language learning techniques and you share this information via your website. Yeah, on the blog page, every week or so, I try to examine an interesting quirk of language and it links up to, to many other things. Uh, language, as you know, is such a vast subject so sometimes I will speak about phonetics, sometimes about grammar, sometimes about a little trick that can help us to learn languages more quickly. And you have been learning languages at school, right? I, I read in your book and that fascinated me that apparently 40 years ago in the UK, it was common to learn two languages. And one of them was French, but it didn't turn out to be a very effective way to learn. To it's speak, right? that, that, one of my favorite sayings, you, you mentioned later on, we're going to come to favorite sayings. There is a saying, the past is another country. And it's true. It's like when you go back 40 years, the UK was a different world. One of the things that happened at 11 years old, English school kids were divided into academic and practical. So your life was decided at 11 years old, which seems crazy. Anyhow, I was funneled into the academic stream. And at my school, as you say, it was compulsory to learn two languages. So I studied French and German, but I also studied pure mathematics. And when I asked the teacher, what, what does that mean, pure mathematics? He said, this is mathematics with no practical application in the real world. <laughs> and it was the same approach with languages. We studied French and German, but without any idea that you speak these languages. As I said, I'd, I'd never met anyone who spoke another language. So I spent my entire time at school and never spoke a word of French or German. We just wrote exercises all the time. Yeah, I see. And then many years after that, one situation changed everything because, well, that's what I understood, or maybe you, you can correct me, but I think the situation that you moved to Africa made it happen finally to learn a, a language. That was the starting point. So when my wife and I were 30, we moved to the Ivory Coast to do volunteer work, humanitarian educational work. And we arrived there, not speaking a word of any language, but English. And to our surprise, no one spoke English. That, that's part of the arrogance of, of English and Americans. In, in my book, I tell a little joke what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? English. And unfortunately, that's the case. We arrived there and we had to find a way of learning French. We lived in a, a home with only French speakers who didn't speak English. So we were forced to pick up French very quickly. So we were very pleased with ourselves. But then we used to go out and speak to normal Ivorians, people from the Ivorian co Ivory Coast. And they used to ask us, well, why don't you learn our language? And it had never occurred to us before <laughs> that they even had a language. Yeah. We thought, well, it, this is a, French is the official language. Surely that's what they speak. But if you walk along the street in any African country, you're not going to hear the colonial language very often. They have their own language, own history, and they should be proud of it. But as maybe we'll come on to, maybe then they've been taught otherwise, which is a shame. Yeah. Maybe let's move back to the mission's goal. Was it related to 
languages? No, not uh, um, initially. The work was educational and humanitarian, not related to, uh, mm -hmm. to languages. Many years later, there was a, there's a big gap between when we were in the Ivory Coast and when we moved to Congo. When we went to Congo, their language became the goal. It was part of our, our job to develop tools for the local languages. And in the meantime, in London and in Paris, where we lived, we had learned Lingala. And we'd had to learn that ourselves, totally from scratch. There was no support, no dictionaries, nothing. So learning and teaching a language was a, a very gradual process over that time. Was it difficult to not speaking in English because, I mean, your wife was with you all this time and you had to learn this language. And was there like a temptation to speak in, in English all the time? Well, of course, <laughs> I suppose. Well, yeah, obviously together, we, we always spoke in English. We, we grew up in the same town, small town in, in England. So that's natural. But as soon as you get outside, any other interact, interaction was in other languages. Um, it's not like going to a tourist destination in Spain or somewhere where you can usually find people that speak English. No one spoke English. So we were forced to learn other languages very quickly. How did you manage to learn these languages so quickly without textbooks? Well, the, the only book available in a lot of languages is the Bible. And sometimes not even the whole Bible. Maybe it's the New Testament. So the only way, since there were no course books, no dictionaries, we would take a copy of the English New Testament. And originally the first language we learned was Lingala. We would compare what the English said and what the Lingala said. And at first you can pick up words that occur very frequently. And then you try and figure out, well, why is that word different in this context? And then you'd go out on the street and you'd ask someone, hey, what does this mean? And very often, as you know, people can't explain their own language very well. But gradually, just by trial and error, asking a lot of questions, We compiled a dictionary of Lingala, which was actually published last year. And within the dictionary, it explains the grammar of the language too. And once we'd figured out the structure of this language, we found that it's the same structure in all the other Bantu languages. It's a group of many hundreds of languages and they all have the same structure. I see, so in a way, The language secret started in Africa because you gathered all the information or your experience and kind of put it in a book, right? Sure. It, the language secret is basically two elements. The first element is to speak a language well, you have to speak it badly. And um, we discovered this the local Africans, if they came from another language area, within weeks they were speaking the local language. Why? Because they had no inhibitions about speaking it badly. They just wanted to communicate by what they needed at the market. So communication, that's the first element. And the second element is the idea of language families. The languages that these people spoke were all in the same language family. And so instinctively, they used the same structure. Now, if we learn which language family English is in, for example, it can help us learn the other languages in that family much more quickly. Until that time in Africa, I didn't even know anything about this concept of language families and how it could help us. Yeah, and how did people react when you were speaking their, their language? Because I assume that there were not as many people there from European countries. In, in one city we lived in, we were the only white people there. And when, <laughs> when a white person opens his mouth, they're expecting the colonial language to come out, French. So when we spoke mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in this case, it was Congo, the reaction is sensational. They're so pleased. They feel so 
honoured in a way that, that you've taken the trouble to learn their language, where they've been taught all their life that their language is a patois or it has no value. So for a white person just to give them the dignity of, of praising their language and saying what a beautiful language it is, and complex too, it has a great effect. So they were very supportive. Yeah, very, very, very supportive. Um, and they they were delight in telling us little expressions or correcting mm. us too, not not in a never in a negative way, but they wanted to be helpful and they wanted us to improve. And the greatest compliment sometimes is when they say, Well, if I close my eyes, I can't even hear that you're white. You know, you you just speak like one of them. <laughs> okay. And, okay. And that, yeah. that's that's a wonderful thrill to have that sort of reaction. Mm -hmm. And if you compare the situation now to, to Germany, um, when it comes to, to speaking a foreign language, do people react differently in Germany? When I speak German? Yes. You mean? Yes. It, it's, I, in any country in the world, people are always happy when you speak their language. Particularly, it's not maybe not you're swiss so the swiss have the reputation of being multilingual maybe people expect it more but because the the british and americans have such a terrible reputation with languages when we speak any language people are pleased and supportive but i must say the reaction the less prestigious the language is perceived to be the better the reaction so german is perceived to be a high level language But even in all the time we've been here, almost no one has attempted to speak to us in English, which is surprising. Um, in yeah. fact, according to a survey, over 60% of German speakers who need English for their job feel uncomfortable or even ashamed speaking English. So there's a big incentive even for a, a widely spoken language like German. English speakers should learn it. Yeah. And you mentioned something like that some of the people, I, I don't know, in Cameroon were or think that their patois is, is of no, no value, right? So where does this come that people think that their language is, is of no value? Or is there someone um, su suppressing them or oppressing them or... Was it maybe even forbidden sometimes to, to speak in yeah. certain dialects? Um, this, this is, uh, we were in Congo, but even if we, if we look to France, for example, there are pictures in schools in the south of France. A hundred years ago, most people there spoke a language called Occitan. But if you see a picture of the school, there's a big notice. It says, uh, soyez propre. Parler français. Mm, Be yeah. clean, speak French. So the implication is terrible. French is clean and your little local language is dirty and inferior. And so pupils in France within living memory would be beaten because they spoke their own language. The same happened in Wales, in the United Kingdom, and also in Congo. <clears throat> so in Congo, they've been brought up with the idea that their language is a patois, It can't express complex thoughts. French is the superior language. Mm. So people have a, a really have a complex about their own language and feel ashamed sometimes speaking it, which is terrible. Yes, it is really sad, I think. And it also happened in the UK, you said. And yeah. with which language or dialect did it <clears throat> happen? <clears throat> They, um, in Wales, even today, about 30% of the population speak Welsh as a first language. But in Welsh schools, again, within living memory, uh, students were punished, sometimes beaten for speaking Welsh. The same happened in Scotland. They have their own language, called Gaelic. And in Ireland, they have also their own language, Irish. Irish, Welsh and Gaelic are all in the same language family. They're a long way from English, 
but people were brought up for generations to believe that these languages were inferior. Yeah, and I see in the language learning world out there, people who want to learn English, and oftentimes people want to learn a specific way of English. So most of the time it is British English or it is American English. And oftentimes I say to myself that it is kind of sad because there are so many other ways of the English language. And we just don't, don't see that many courses that, that kind of advertise like that. So it's always British or American. And to me, I don't know, it, it hurts a little bit. And yeah, it's just my it's opinion. <laughs> it, no, it's true because well, here we're moving on to the question of accent as well. Again, until, until the Beatles, actually, the Beatles changed everything in the United Kingdom. Until that time, everyone on the BBC the British Broadcasting Corporation, everyone had to speak with a certain classic British accent. And every other accent was looked down upon. But when the Beatles came along speaking with a strong Liverpool accent, that changed things a bit. But yeah. even today, there is a strong pressure, let's say from people from Jamaica. Jamaicans speak beautiful English with a beautiful yes. accent. It's very colorful, but they feel under pressure to eliminate that accent and make it conform, as you say, either to American English or to British English. Yeah, absolutely. And well, let's talk a little bit more about the Bantu languages. There are some, some uh, peculiarities, I call it. For example, there is this class system in the language. I read that in your book and it was so astonishing to me. When I am learning French, I just have to learn the if it's masculine or family, feminine, right? So le or la. And how is it in the Bantu languages? Maybe you could tell us something about that. That's interesting, yeah. So Bantu languages don't have a gender like le or la, but they have something called class. So every noun is in a particular class. Now, in some of the more complex Bantu languages, there are up to 20 classes. Um, the, the most complex one I learned has 16. So instead of having the choice between le and la, you have to figure out which of the 16 classes is the noun in. And every other element in the sentence, the verb, adjective, everything has to agree. Just mm. like in, in French, we say um, masculine is beau and feminine is belle we have to integrate that in Bantu languages too. So it's extremely complex, but once you get to know the system, it's also very logical and very beautiful. It make, makes the language sound very harmonious and musical. And how did you manage to learn this? Yeah, it, it, it's a lot easier than it sounds, but um, for example, Larry, one of the languages that we had to learn from scratch, um, they have four words for this or that. So in, in French, for example, we have ce, and if it's feminine, we say set. So we have a, a number of possibilities. So we have four words for this or that in Larry, but they change according to the class. So 16 classes, four lots of 16 or 64. So we have 64 different ways of saying <laughs> this or that. It takes a lot of work, but once you get the sort of knack of it, it sounds mm -hmm. natural and um, it's very satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit in intimidating, right? So <laughs> it, it sounds worse than it is, but it's once that is the, the complexity of Bantu languages is the class system, but there are many ways in, that, in which they're far simpler than European languages, and that makes them easier to learn in some ways. Another thing that I found quite interesting was that every child in Congo receives a personalized name. And for example, I noted down Mparsi 
I don't know how to pronounce it, but it means pain. Yeah. And maybe you could tell us more about this. Yeah. Pasi, pasi is a, it's a very common word in Lingala and Congo. And there's lots of people whose name is Pasi. So when a child, a Congolese child, receives its name, there has to be some connection to the circumstances. So passy, pain, maybe life was tough at the time. Maybe the mother even died in childbirth or had a very difficult birth. So when you meet someone from passy, you know immediately something, something hard, something difficult was going on at the time they were born. Yeah, so I assume that a lot of people or having a hard time. Life in Congo, a few years ago, the, the UN produced a list of the, it's called the HDI, Human Development Index. Uh, and Congo was very bottom of that list. They measure things like life expectancy, infrastructure, education. It's a country with a difficult history that has suffered a lot. And um, that's why that name, Pasi, is so common. But there are positive ones too, that, that they're very religious people. Uh, Ndombele, the, um, there's a footballer actually in England called Ndombele. Ndombele means I asked. So that means I asked God for a child or I asked God for a son and he listened to me. So there's always, always something about the birth that we can determine from the name. <laughs> It is quite interesting as well. I read that in your book that the... The thing is that many times the connotations that a word has changes depending on the culture. This was like an eye opener to me because, yeah, maybe you, you can explain why. Well, every word has a meaning. Every language has a word for the sun in German, Dizona or Le Soleil in French. So we know what that means. But when we say the word sun in English or German, It usually has a very positive connotation. We think summer, here comes the sun, the winter's ending, nice times on the beach, sun. But if you say that in Africa, the word sun doesn't have the same meaning. The sun is the enemy. The sun is too hot to stand out in. Everyone seeks the shade. So in Congo, the word for sun is ntangu. Tangu also means time. So the sun is not your friend. The sun is just what marks the time. Yeah, and that makes it even more interesting to learn languages because actually you need to, to learn the culture. It's not just the language. And for me, it is clear that it goes hand in hand, right? You're, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, language is a pathway into culture. And that's why to be successful in learning a language, we have to be interested in the people, not just in the words on the page. Yeah. Is there any expression or saying in a Bantu language that you really love? Oh, there are lots. But it's a very, very, very colorful way of expressing yourself. One I like is Mulo Silange Bintuntu. Mulo Silange Bintuntu. That's in Congo. It literally means. I throw you flowers. And what that means is, well done, congratulations, you've done a good job. I throw you flowers. Um, there's another one, Molange uh, Mpembe, that's in Lingala. Molange Mpembe, that means a white bottle. And the idea of that is a white or a clear bottle, you can just see through it and you know what's inside. Mm. So a person who is a clear bottle doesn't hide their emotions. We say in English, they wear their heart on their sleeve. You can see right mm -hmm. through them. You can tell what they're thinking. Beautiful. <laughs> And is there anything that you really miss of uh, Congo or the Ivory Coast? What is it that you miss the most? It's just the people. If you go out on the streets, there's no barrier anywhere it's human mm -hmm. interaction is so easy you can you can strike up a conversation with anyone on any topic and within two minutes it's like you've been friends for life there's no 
excuse me, would you mind helping me? Um, yeah. In Europe, we're very constrained. We feel maybe uneasy if a stranger approaches us. What do they want? What do they want from me? Mm-hmm. But in Africa, mm-hmm. the human interaction, the human warmth, that's what I miss, I think. Yes, in Switzerland, it's also a little bit, I want to have my my borders or my, I don't know how to... Personal space, personal space, yeah. Exactly, yes. And my father comes from Argentina, and I always loved it when I was there on vacation to meet the people because they were so open-hearted, right? So they were they were just different than... Swiss people. So I kind of like that, <laughs> the openness, yeah. because in my case, I am very shy, I would say. But sometimes when I was in Argentina, I felt like I was less shy because I was like in an, another culture and also my personality changed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's interesting. Scientists say, actually, that when we learn another language, a different part of our brain is used than the part which is used for our mother tongue. So when we learn another language, we literally do become another person. So when you speak Spanish, you are actually a different person. And it's the same with me. If I speak French or Lingala or German, I become a different person. And that's another wonderful aspect of language learning. Yes, absolutely. And how often do you get to speak the Bantu languages these days? Well, we have a lot of friends. We've kept contact with uh, friends in Congo and we have a, a lot of friends even here in Germany that come from that background. So regularly, you know, most weeks we, we get to speak Lingala and um, less frequently Congo or Lari, but every week usually we speak Lingala. Let's move to your book, The Language Secret. First off, What inspired you to write the book? Well, after we'd spent this time in Africa, we had just become very used to the idea that everyone spoke many, many languages. It wasn't unusual anymore. Then when we came back to Europe, we we found we had to stay here. People were always saying, that's incredible that you can speak so many languages. And we'd forgotten that it was incredible in European terms. So what inspired us was, We want everyone to know that it's not that difficult. Everyone can speak a language and everyone can speak multiple languages if they want to. Yeah, that is nice. And I'm going to read the title again because it goes further. The language secret and then how to learn a foreign language and then or how to speak 10 languages badly. So what does it mean exactly? It means don't be a perfectionist. Some people will not utter even a sentence unless they have prepared it in their head and they're satisfied that it's grammatically accurate and it's pronounced perfectly. And so by the time they've gone through that process in their head, the person listening to them has figured out they can't speak the language very well and has replied in English. So you've lost the opportunity to practice your language. So speak a language badly. Get it out. Don't be a perfectionist. The problem with language apps and with language learning in general is usually we cannot move on to the next question before we've got the previous question right. That's a big mistake in my view, because even if we say the sentence wrong, the person will usually understand. And that's the first step. Speak the language badly. In time, you'll speak it well. For example, um, if a person, if you ask a a foreigner in the UK, how long have you lived here? You will often reply something like, I am living here since three years. Now, if you analyse that sentence, there's three grammatical mistakes in there. But who cares? We ask the question and we got the information. That's what counts. So even if we get the, the, the sentence grammatically wrong, if we speak badly, it's the first step to speak yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, it took me about two years to just start out with my podcast project where I talk in English because I did not get 
any practice. I, I was not able to speak fluently. And that's why I decided to push myself, right? And, and to just start out and to talk to people. So well, you, you, speak, <laughs> you speak fantastically. And what, you know what? Even if there are tiny mistakes, who cares? You're a great communicator. And that's the thing we have to know. Language is about communication. It's not about perfection. Thank you so much, John. And so who is the book for? Because, well, it's, it's obvious, right? But maybe you can give us further explanations. Well, in fact, there's, you said at the very outset of the podcast that maybe you're not the target audience. Well, yeah, yes and no. The first is monoglots, English-speaking monoglots, English speakers that have never, ever got over the psychological block of speaking another language. So it examines the process. What does it mean to learn a language? How does it work? So the first audience are English speaking monoglots. And the second audience are people like you, people that love language, that maybe speak two or three already, but would like to know more about how language works and would like to accelerate the process. We all have limited time. We can't spend many hours every day pursuing our passion of languages. So the second target audience is people that want to become multilingual without having to spend 24 hours a day doing it. Okay. And what about the last sentence, how to speak 10 languages badly? But it's not for people who basically want to learn 10 languages. Is this just a reference to you because you learn 10 languages badly? Yeah. Basically, but it is showing that, as we said before, there is a concept called language families. So because people in Africa already knew one language in that family, it made it easier to learn the others. In the same way, English belongs to a language family. And because of an accident of history, English has connections between two groups of that family. And once we learn that there are things called sound shifts, an English person can learn German and Dutch very quickly. And also on the other side, Spanish, Italian, French. So it's quite accessible to even an average English man or woman to learn 10 languages badly. Okay, thank you. So we are going to touch on different questions that came up when I read the book. But of course, we don't want to reveal all the tips and tricks because it is... <laughs> yes, otherwise no one will buy the book. <laughs> Your book is, is packed with tips and tricks and cultural reference. So my first question is, why do we have to be very clear in our mind what our objectives are? Because... There is a big difference between speaking a language and being able to read it. As I said before, I spent five years at school studying French. I could read approximately what was on the page, but I couldn't speak one single word. So uh, the first chapter is called the Birmingham screwdriver. For those that don't know what that means, a Birmingham screwdriver is a hammer. So just as we can't use a hammer to turn a screw, we can't learn to speak a language by reading it. So if you want to speak the language, I know this sounds obvious, we actually have to speak it. If you're using an app that just enables you to type it in, you are not going to be able to speak the language. So we have to be clear about whether we want to speak or read. Thank you, John. And you mentioned a book by Dr. Seuss, and it's called The Cat in the Hat as a Child. And it contains only 225 words. What is that all about? And why did you well, mention it? <laughs> well, it, it's a very funny book. Most, most children of my generation grew up with that book. Actually, later, Dr. Seuss, he wrote a book with only 50 words called Green Eggs and Ham. 50. So if you can write a book with just 50 words, we don't need a lot of words to speak another language. 
Uh, in fact, it's been estimated that if we know 1,000 words, we can see anything at all in our target language. So that means if we learn six words a day in six months, we can actually express ourselves in every everyday situation. So the lesson is we don't need many words. And how does a sense of humor help us to get better English skills or language skills? Well, in, in fact, I, I, it's interesting to define a sense of humor. Everyone thinks, yes, I have a sense of humor, but not everyone does. Everyone laughs, of course. Everyone finds some things amusing, but a sense of humor is the ability to laugh at yourself. And if we, if we can't laugh at ourselves and our own mistakes, we're going to find language learning very painful because we're going to make mistakes all the time. Mostly people are going to be too polite to laugh, but occasionally we're going to say something so outrageous that it will raise a smile. So if we take ourselves too seriously, language learning will be hard. We need a sense of humor. Yeah, and it's no good to beat ourselves up, right? So this will have a negative impact on us. So we sure. should be positive, yeah, and, and have a sense well, one, of humor. One, and one, of my, one of my favorite sayings is, There is no such thing as a happy perfectionist. It's true. Yeah. If, if we are perfectionists, we're never happy because nothing is ever perfect. And that's yeah. per in language learning, perfectionism is the number one enemy. Absolutely. And something I liked quite a lot is the different characters that appear in your book. So, for example, we have Jurgen Klopp, we have Inspector Clouseau, we have the special one. We have Van Dijk, and there are many, many others. So what role do they have in your book? And maybe you, well, could, it, you could talk about one or two that you really liked in uh, okay, so more detail. The, okay, so the idea is most, most of the chapters start with a character. It could be a real person or a character in a film or song. And... This leads us on to the theme of the chapter. So, for example, Klopp, uh, Jürgen Klopp is a very, very good communicator in English. He's, he's a, for those that don't know, he's the coach of Liverpool Football Club in England, who just won the League Cup final yesterday. Um, we learn two things from him. Number one, he's not a perfectionist. He makes loads of mistakes in English, but he's a fantastic communicator. Very, very good communicator. Why? Because he doesn't worry about perfection. The other thing we learn about him, every now and again, he will say a really, really bad English swear word live on television. <laughs> and the lesson we learn there is that we should steer very, very clear of taboo languages, taboo words in our target language. Because evidently, Herr Klopp doesn't realize quite how strong it sounds. When, when, when we use taboo language and we don't know the context or the culture, we could really give strong offense. So my advice to all those learners is don't learn slang. Don't learn taboo language. Make sure that you really know the language before you even venture into those areas. Another uh, character, Inspector Clouseau, for those that know the Pink Panther film, Inspector Clouseau was a, a character played by Peter Sellers. He has a ridiculously strong French accent. <laughs> And what we learn from that is maybe the best way of getting a, a more authentic accent is by just humor. Try and imagine in our head what a French accent or a German accent or a Spanish accent sounds like. And by doing that, we can have fun and we can improve our accent at the same time. Another one was Van Dijk, and I think he is a, an actor, right? Yeah, in the 1960s, there was a, a very famous film called Mary Poppins, and an American actor, Dick Van Dyke, was chosen to play the role of a Londoner with a Cockney accent. And his acting performance has become notorious as the worst attempt at a, a foreign accent of all time. 
It's utterly, utterly ridiculous. It sounds nothing like a Londoner. So the lesson again from this little story is how can we sound a little bit less ridiculous when we speak another language? We're not so everyone has an accent. Um, when I speak German, I have an accent. When you speak English, you have an accent. There's nothing wrong with that. It's lovely to hear these different accents. But if it's too strong, then it can prevent communication and distract from the message we're trying to get. Across. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question. So Google Translate and other translation software butcher all. And what do you mean by that? And what does butcher okay. mean? So for those that don't know the word, in, in, in ancient times, if you wanted to make a piece of furniture, you'd have to go and chop a tree down out of the forest. So the work of the bodger was he'd chop down the tree and then hack it into approximately the shape of the furniture. And then the craftsman would come in and apply the finishing touch. So Google Translate, if you type in a letter or a sentence, it will give you very approximately the message you're looking for. But the craftsman, the human translator then needs to work on it because any sentence in Google Translate or Bing Translate contains so many errors, we could never ever put that out in an important document. If you just want to use it as a quick way of communication, that's fine. But if you want to convey the exact message, you need a craftsman, you need a human translator. Okay, thank you so much. And in my case, I am using another software called DeepL. So it's less known to, to the people out there, but it's basically similar to Google Translate, DeepL. And I, I love it, I love it so much. Okay, I'll check that, I'll check that out, DeepL. I've never heard of that. But again, I'm not condemning the use of it. It's just that AI, artificial intelligence, will never completely replace human translators and interpreters. And do you think this will change in about 10 years? I don't think so. As we spoke earlier, connotation. A yeah. human can feel like sun. A human can pick up cultural references. A human can, can feel the register, the tone. Uh, it's going to take a long time, if ever, before computers can do that. Personally, I don't think they ever will. Thank you. So. The next one is a critical one because it's about not giving up on our journey because this is, well, one of the crucial things in my view because, yeah, it's important to, to get going, obviously. And in your book, you mentioned that at various points you were about to give up. So please tell us a little bit more about the obstacles and how you overcame them. That's a very good question, Daniel. I think most people, when they start on the journey, they think that it's going to be a little bit like a hillside. You're, you're just going to walk up and make progress, and it's like a straight line. But in reality, anyone who's learned a language will tell you it's more like a set of steps. So you make progress, and then for a long time, it seems that you're staying on the same level. And then you'll go up another little bit, and then you'll stay on another plateau, another level. And it's when you're on these plateaus, when you don't seem to be making any progress, that's when you feel like giving up. So before we even embark on the journey, we have to visualize it as more of a series of steps than a straight line. We have to prepare ourselves mentally for the fact that there are going to be days, sometimes weeks, where we don't appear to be getting anywhere at all. And what was an example of yours in the process of writing your book? What was one of these obstacles? One of the things, just in Lingala, there's um, the word for we is biso, and the word for you, binu, biso binu. And for literally six months, I couldn't 
get those words in my head. They are the, among the most common words in the language, bisobino, and I felt utterly useless that I couldn't, in a simple conversation, distinguish between we and you. And I got very discouraged. I'm never, ever going to crack this language. Mm. And then one day it clicked and I went on. And what about you as an author? I mean, there must have been a time in which you came across some obstacles. The obstacles are there are in the publishing industry, there are literally thousands of books coming out every week. And a book can easily disappear. So there were days when I thought, no one is ever going to get to read this book. No one, I've put years of my life into researching this. No one is going to ever know that it's there. But with support, like for instance, this is a great support. Uh, you and your listeners are now aware. You've obviously read the book very carefully. You've done your research. That's so heartwarming. Just when, when a person does that, You think, yeah, all the effort is worthwhile. But there were days when I thought no one is ever going to read it at all. Okay, so we are very lucky that you did it anyway. And what is your next book all about? Well, I have two in the pipeline, actually. As you said, the subtitle of this first book is How to Speak Ten Languages Badly. So the next book is We're going to take it a step further. How to speak a language well. Because, great, now we, we can communicate, we speak, but we speak with a lot of mistakes. Maybe our goal is to go to the next level. So that's one of the books that I'm working on. The other book is called A Story of Congo in 26 Words. So it's going to take one word, starting with each letter of the alphabet, and each word will tell a story about the culture and history and life of people in Congo. So I have those two on the go. That sounds very promising and interesting. And how long do we have to wait until it's coming out? Um, I don't know. It depends how many people buy this one. So if, if, if all, everyone could buy a copy, then um, it might help me to bring the other ones out quicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where do we find you, John? Well, as I say, my website is www.thelanguagesecret.com. The book is available on Amazon, any, any of the Amazon platforms, amazon.com, amazon.uk, amazon.de for Germany. And if you just type in John Stedman, The Language Secret, that will take you to the homepage for the book. And you are having also an Instagram account and I love it how you upload different pictures which gives you kind of a revision of some topics um, that are covered in the book right yeah so again the Instagram handle is the language secret one word and every couple of days I will post a, a short extract from the book or something relating to language and then That will hopefully motivate people to explore further. And there are links to other websites. Hopefully your own will be on there very soon on this podcast. But also I'm visible on Twitter. Also the language secret. So people can get one or two little gems on there. Okay, John. So you already mentioned your favorite sayings or expressions in the Bantu languages. But maybe you want to share others in English. One that I like very much is give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish and you feed him for life. So the idea is if, if you give someone something, that's great. But if you teach them how to do it, then they're independent and they can work on their own. So I could spend many, many hours going through different tips on learning a language but if I teach you the principles of learning a language if I teach you how to fish then you can go off and do it yourself no matter what language you're interested in and so that's the idea of the book really I'm teaching people how to fish it's not going to tell you how to learn any specific language it's going to teach you how to learn any language so give a man a fish and 
feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you feed him for life. I love it, yes. Thank you so much. It was really nice chatting with you, John. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. It's been uh, lovely to be with you, and thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Okay. Bye, John. Thank Bye. you.